Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 3. Proverbs 2, 3. It says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. So, if you remember, it's been a few weeks ago, but <clears throat> we covered verses 1 and 2 last uh, time that we met. And verses 1 and 2 gave us the first condition that was necessary to obtain the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And now this verse sets forth the second condition to obtain it. And then the second condition is comprised of two conditions itself. So we're going to look at both of those things tonight. So the first one is, the first part of it, if thou criest after knowledge. So in Proverbs 2.1, we learn that you have to first receive the word, and then you have to hide it in your heart. So to receive it, you got to be willing, like with your hands out, basically, to take it. And then to hide it in your heart, then you have to keep it. So accept it, keep it. And then... In verse 2, you have to incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. So the first one was getting it and keeping it, and then this one is exerting effort. So inclining, leaning towards it, listening, wanting to hear it, wanting to, to know what is being taught, and applying that heart to knowledge. So putting in the legwork to understand. Now the next step is crying after knowledge, and that's what we're looking at here in verse 3. Knowledge is the fact of knowing a thing, state, etc., or in general sense, a person, acquaintance, familiarity uh, gained by experience. So Jesus Christ is the truth himself. So the, the, the description of knowledge there, when it is to get to know a person, that, that applies here as well, because Jesus Christ is called the wisdom of God, and he, of course, is a person. And the words that he inspired to write down are the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. So this definition fits quite well. So there'd be many things that we could learn out there, many, many facets of knowledge, but we're not supposed to cry after those, like, for instance, science or literature or arts or politics or any of those things we could give ourselves to learn. And I, I love learning all kinds of stuff, and I have multiple interests, and I could read books on various things all day long and, and be very happy, but yet that's not what I'm supposed to give myself to. And there's nothing wrong with learning that kind of stuff, but that shouldn't be the thing that we're crying out to learn, right? We should be crying out to learn the knowledge of God. The Apostle Paul is a good example of this. He was a very educated man. They didn't have universities back then like we have today, but basically, Paul would have had a prestigious university education, like a Harvard Divinity degree or something like that. That would have been basically what he had back in those days. He studied at the feet of a man named Gamaliel. If you look in Acts 22, in verse 3, he, he explains to the Jews when he's giving his defense that he was one of them, that he was a Pharisee, and he's kind of giving his credentials so that they'll listen to what he has to say. And he tells them that he was trained under one of the greatest teachers of the law that Israel had. Acts 22 and verse 3. He says, I, for, he says, I verily am a man. I verily, I am verily, let me, let me start again. I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, Yet brought up in this city that is in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. I don't know if you've listened to people, but I've listened to some um, PhDs. Like I listen to a podcast. He's from a PhD and then he, he has a PhD and then he interviews other guys sometimes. And it, when he refers to somebody, he'll talk about what school they went to and what doctor that he trained under and got his PhD. Like he, he got his degree under such and such a man, you know, doctor such and such. And this is basically what Paul's saying here. I got my credentials from Dr. Gamaliel, if, if there would have been, you know, such a term back then. And Gamaliel was a, a reputable teacher in Israel, and we see that in Acts chapter 5. Now I'm, I'm building up to this for a reason. Acts chapter 5 and verse 34. This is, this is whenever the, the, the Pharisees and the, the priests are trying to figure out what to do with Peter and the other apostles because they won't shut their mouths about Jesus. And in verse 34, it says, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, 
a doctor of the law. Actually, I said that they didn't have doctors back then. They did have doctors back then, right? A doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So here he is, had in reputation, and he's a doctor. So I guess I wasn't thinking about that. He actually was a PhD, basically. He had his doctorate in the law, you could say. So Paul's highly educated. He's a highly accomplished man. You look in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. He again is bragging on himself a little bit, not for the sake of bragging, not because he was proud and arrogant, but because he's trying to make a point here to show these Jews that, look, I was just like you guys and, and better, for that matter. He says in, in Philippians 3, 4 through 6, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I am more circumcised the eighth day, that was part of the law of Moses, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. Like he was he's cream of the crop. As touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. And this is how zealous I was when the rest of you guys were just out there talking about how pesky these Christians are. I was out there hailing them off to prison, right? I was extremely zealous. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Nobody could point to the law and, and show Paul condemned. He kept every little letter of it. Not Maybe not in his heart, as he goes on to say in Romans chapter 7, but he was keeping the letter of it outwardly anyway. So Paul had this great education, been brought up under Dr. Gamaliel, right? Reputable scholar in Israel. And yet, when Paul was converted, he counted all that stuff but loss and but dung, that he could win Christ, that he could have the knowledge of Christ. And it wasn't that I could get eternal salvation so I could go to heaven. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about just having the knowledge of Christ, just knowing Christ. He counted all that stuff but dung. Look at Philippians 3 and verse 8. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. They're just worthless. I'm just writing them off. All things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So he looked at that, all that education, all that knowledge of all the, the worldly things that he had, and he considered it no more valuable than whenever he got up off the toilet and flushed it. Right? That's, that's how valuable that stuff was to him. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. <clears throat> I think there's so many people out there that profess to be Christians that just think that I'm saved. and I, I'm saved and that's, that's all that matters. And that's great. Right, I mean that's the beginning, but boy, there's a lot of knowledge to learn. There's a lot of things to learn about God and about how God saved you, rather than just saying I'm saved and now I just go off and live, do whatever I want. That's not the proper response of a person that's really been saved. Verse nine, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. Remember, we're supposed to cry after knowledge. Paul wanted to know him. He wanted to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, that's the thing. If you get to know Christ closely, you will be in fellowship with his sufferings. And you'll know because you'll, you, you really can know somebody when you've walked in their shoes, as they say. Well, the closer you draw to Christ, the more suffering you're going to have in your life. We'd think it'd be the opposite of that, right? The closer you draw to God, the more God's going to protect you. God's going to bless you in every way and everything's going to be wonderful. But you know, Solomon said, in much knowledge is much grief and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrows in Ecclesiastes in the, in the end of chapter one. So Paul wanted to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. And, and boy, did he. You read about Paul beaten with rods thrice, you know, 39 stripes received, I save one five times from the Jews. He was shipwrecked. He was naked. He was, he was, had perils of robbers and perils of his own countrymen and perils in the sea. All those things. He was in prison with Silas there, stripped down and beaten and so on. He really got to know Jesus Christ because he walked with Christ. So I would ask, are you willing are every one of us willing to count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord? 
Is it worth it, like Paul, to say, you know what, I'd give up anything to know Jesus Christ more closely, to understand him better, to know his word? Just think about that. I want you to think about that as we go through this. So Proverbs 2, 3 tells us that we need to cry after knowledge, which that tells us that knowledge is not innate in man, or the knowledge of God anyway is not innate in man, meaning that it's not already there. Right? We don't, we're not born with the knowledge of God. We don't learn the knowledge of God just naturally as we go through our lives. That's something that has to be given to us, and it's something that has to be cried out for. It's also, this verse would imply, that it's not given to those who will exert little effort for it. Because if you have to cry out for it, that means that it's something that you really want and desire, and it's not something that you can just find laying around somewhere. You've got to really ask for it. To cry means to entreat, beg, beseech, implore with a loud and a moved or excited voice. Have you ever done that? Have you ever cried after knowledge, the knowledge of God? Just think about that. Now, I know that a lot of you, you, you grew up in the church. Like Carissa, Austin, Wayne, you grew up a primitive Baptist. So you, you guys have... have you, you grew up knowing a lot of the things that we believe. And people like me and others that didn't grow up with this, we, I, I li- quite literally did cry out for knowledge. And I was confused and I didn't understand and I wanted to know the truth. I got to the point where I just literally in the shower one night, I just, I want to know the truth, Lord, no matter what, I don't care what it costs me. And it cost me so, so dearly. And I'm not going to get into that, but it cost me dearly. And it has continued to cost me dearly as I've gone through this Christian life. But it doesn't matter. Even if you were, if you were born into it, there's still so much to learn in this Bible. There's still so much of the gospel, so much of the doctrine to learn. And have you ever cried out to God for it, entreated, begged, beseech, implore? Have you ever begged God and say, Lord, I just want to know more. I want to go beyond what I know now, and I want to learn thy word. I want to learn about thee. I want to know more. Have you ever done that? And if you haven't done that, I'm encouraging you tonight to do that. You've got to be serious about it if you're going to do that. So based on the definition... If a man desires the knowledge and wisdom of God, he has to ask for it, right? That, that's simple enough, right? But just simply asking is not going to suffice. Because if his request is to be granted per this formula in, Roman, or in Proverbs chapter 2, he has to beg, beseech, implore the Lord, not in a lukewarm, lackadaisical tone, but in a loud and impassioned voice, right? That you really have to want it and really ask for it fervently. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 that the Lord is a rewarder of them that not, that's right, not to just seek him, but diligently seek him. That's exactly right. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you have to diligently seek him, and you also have to believe that he will reward that diligent seeking, and he'll give you what you're seeking and what you've asked for. Because sometimes I think we ask for things from God, and we don't really believe that he'll even do it. We might believe that he can do it, right? But we might not believe that he actually will do it. And he's not always going to give you what you want. You have to pray according to his will and, and so on, you know, so there are there are qualifications for prayers to be answered, but one of them is believe that he, at least he's able to do it and believe that he will do it if it's his will to do so. That's, it that's is it. his will that we learn about him. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That's a, one of the number one things that is his will. Exactly. So you can pray that prayer truly believing that he will give it to you. Right? You could pray for, for many things and he might give it to you or might not because he hasn't specifically stated that that's his will to do so. But yeah, you're right, Bev. In this case, that is his will. And he will give it to you if you really want it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given, right? 
But if we compare the scriptures, we have to see here that you don't only just ask, but you have to ask with importunity. Let's look at Luke 11, 5 through 9. This is a parallel text with Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's Matthew 7, 7. But let's look over in Luke. And we're going to see here that it's, it's more than just saying, hey Lord, I'd like to know more. Just that, you know, and then just hoping that somehow, some way, I, I, I know it, I learn it. It's, it's not just that. It's, you really got to ask for it. With importunity, you got you to gotta be tenacious with the Lord. Luke 11, 5 through 9. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine is in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are in bed, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. You can't blame the guy. If somebody came beating on my door at midnight, I'm not going to answer the door either. Right? Give me a loaf of bread. I'm like, go down to Walmart. Right? Ask me for a loaf of bread. Well, in those days, you know, there was no Walmart. So you got, if somebody shows up in the middle of the night, you got to have something to feed him. That was, that was the, the proper thing to do in those days. So you go knocking on a friend's door. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. See, friends, friends are going to cut it. You know what? I'm not getting out of bed at midnight, even if you're on my friend. Yet, because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Importunity is troublesome pertinacity in solicitation. He's just going to keep hammering on that door and say, Look, I need some bread. Go away. I'm in, I'm in bed. I don't want to get up. Boom, boom, boom. I need some bread. And I'm not going to quit banging on this door until you give me some bread. That's what you have to do with the Lord. And this is where it gets tied in. Verse 9. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. You see, now if you just had the Matthew passage there, you wouldn't have got that little story in the, you know, before the ask, and it shall be given passage. And you wouldn't have understood what type of asking God is talking about here. That's why it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture. God will give His elect the knowledge they desire if they cry day and night unto Him for it. Look at Luke 18, 1 through 5. It didn't all come to me at once when I was first converted to the doctrine of grace. Um, I, when I first heard about it, I, I despised it. I hated it. I set out to disprove it. And I'd argue with people about it. And eventually, when I, I think when I just got to the point where I was thoroughly confused and I just couldn't figure it out, that's when I cried out to the Lord. I just want to know the truth and I don't care what it costs. And then that, shortly after that, that's when things started to open up. That's when my heart, my mind started to open up. That's when I started to understand. And I'll get to this a little bit later. That is a common story among people of our faith. I've heard many people share some similar story of that. Luke 18, 1 through 5. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. That pretty much sounds like most of our judges, huh? And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. At least he was honest. You know, most of them would pretend at least to fear God, right? All our presidents say, God bless America, and they half of them probably don't even believe in him. But uh, yet because of Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So he's just, he's a pragmatist, basically. He's like, you know what, I'm just going to give her whatever she wants. I'm just sick and tired of hearing her coming to me about this. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Pay attention to this guy. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? The idea is, 
if this unjust judge would eventually give in to the cries of this widow just because just for his own sake basically how much more so will God avenge his own elect how much more so will God answer the prayers of his elect though they cry long they bear you know he, he they cry day and night and he bears long with them and what's that tell us you got to cry and ask and beseech for a while right God wants to see are you serious about this or not I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth God will avenge them and when he does avenge them he'll avenge them speedily he'll answer those prayers speedily but he takes a while to get to where he's ready to answer the prayer but when he does he he gives you the the whole thing he wants to see that his children sincerely desire to know his truth before he grants it to them he'll be long suffering He's never going to chasten you or chastise you for repeatedly pleading with him for knowledge and wisdom rather than upbraiding us for our ignorance. He he will give us the wisdom we ask liberally if we ask in faith, nothing wavering. Look at James 1, 5 through 7. This is the this is the key verse. This one and the, and the one we're looking at here in Proverbs chapter 2. This the that passage there, the first five verses in Proverbs 2, this compared with James 1, 5 through 7, these two, if you, if, you, if you have any room in the margin of your Bible, I jot down Proverbs 2, 1 through 6, next to James 1, 5, because these are, these are excellent parallel texts here. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. There's so much in that verse. Let me, let me get verse 6 and then we'll go back to it. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he says there, if you lack wisdom, so that could be lacking wisdom in the scriptures, the knowledge of God, or that could just be lacking wisdom like good decision-making, if you don't, if you just do stupid things and you just keep screwing up and you, your life is just hard because you do one dumb thing after another, well, if you lack wisdom, ask God. It says he giveth to all men liberally, all men that ask, right? So if people that ask and they ask like God says to ask where you really want it, he gives it to all men. He gives it liberally. Liberally, I have the definition here, is bountifully, freely, generously. Liberal has a bad negative connotation today, but liberal is actually a good thing. Right? And to be a liberal in the like, dictionary sense of the word is good. That means you're a generous person. Right? Of course, the liberals have co-opted that term, just like the sodomites have co-opted gay. And they take all these good words and they, they use them for their own perverse lifestyles. But anyway, there's nothing wrong with being a liberal in the biblical sense. Um, the Bible actually commends the liberal soul. Right? But he's not talking about Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. He's <clears throat> talking about good and generous people. Anyway, he giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. To upbraid means to reproach, reprove, censure a person. So God gives bountifully the wisdom asked for, and he's not going to reprove or censure. He's not going to say, quit bothering me, I'm busy. He's not going to say, well, you shouldn't have to ask for this. Why don't you already know that? I mean, heck, you've been going to church for how many years? Why don't you already know that? Why are you asking me for wisdom? You should already know. He's not going to say that. He's not going to make you feel stupid. He's going to give you the wisdom that you ask for. And then look at this. And it shall be given him. See, that's a shall. It doesn't say it might be given to him or it could be given to him. And the Lord, you know, he, he, he you know, there's a 50-50 chance. It shall be given. So if you ask and you cry out for it, like Proverbs 2 says you will get the wisdom that you ask for. Now, I, I know I've mentioned this before, and this is not in the outline, but I am absolutely 100% convinced that the reason why people out there do not come to the knowledge of the truth is because they don't want to. They don't want it badly enough. They don't ask for it and truly ask for it, like the verses we've been reading today. Because if they did, the Bible says that it shall be given them. And if it's not given them, it means they didn't ask. Now they can say, oh, I ask, I want to know the truth. I'm going to call you a liar 
Because the Bible says it shall be given if you ask. So I'm going to say maybe you said the words, but you don't really mean it. You don't really want to know the truth, and you're not really willing to give up whatever you have to to get it. Because if you are, it shall be given him. That's why I just don't have a whole lot of patience for for people when I get into you know theological debates with people and and they tell I just want to know the truth and then you show them you show them the verse and they deny what it says what it teaches mm-hmm. I'm sorry you know I don't believe that you do want to know the truth because if you did you would get it yes yep. of course there was actually a person <laughs> that I knew here a few years ago. And I asked this person, if you, are you a truth seeker? Do you want to know the truth? And this person actually said, no, (laughs) which, and this was a professing Christian. And I was just, because I was kind of, you know, I was expecting the answer to be yes. And then I had a certain line of argumentation that I was going to go down or point this person to a certain thing. And then when this person said, no, I was like, wow, most people at least make a pretense of wanting to, I was just like, well, but don't you, I mean, you believe that Jesus is, is, is God, right? Oh, yeah. Well, you'd want to defend that, right? Well, yeah. And then I'm like, well, so you do want to know the truth somewhat. Well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so I like had to convince this person that, that she actually did uh, want to know the truth. So that was odd. I, most people will tell, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to know the truth, of course. <laughs> then the second part of Proverbs 2, 3. And liftest up thy voice for understanding. So this is kind of like crying, lifting up the voice. Only this time, instead of for knowledge, it's for understanding. Understanding is the faculty of the intellect, the power or ability to understand a thing. So to have the knowledge of God without the power to apprehend the meaning of it wouldn't be of very much value. So you can have knowledge of things, just have facts in your head. And you can know a whole bunch of facts. But if you don't have the power to connect those facts... In, in to understand a whatever the, the thing is you're trying to understand, then it doesn't, doesn't really help you out much, right? I mean, just think about it. If you had a sentence and you just mixed up all the words in the sentence, and maybe you had the knowledge of the definition of each word in the sentence, but if the words aren't in the right order, that sentence isn't going to make any sense. Even though you technically know all the definitions, it's the same way with the Bible. Somebody, a reprobate, can take the Bible and he can, he, he's got a dictionary like I have, right? He can, he can look up the definition in a dictionary. He can define the terms, but it just doesn't, he doesn't get it, right? It just doesn't make sense to him, right? He doesn't have the understanding. Now, God's children are, start out without the understanding, and that's why we need to ask for the understanding so that we can put it together and make it make sense. So just like the knowledge has to be cried for, understanding has to, you have to lift up your voice for it as well. And there have been many young men out, out there, and I say many, I mean many relatively speaking, not, not very many really, but there have been some out there that have received the understanding that they earnestly desire for after they lift up their voice in prayer to God for him, begging for it no matter the cost. And I've done this myself, I just told you that. Um, when, I was, when we were at the, um, the anniversary, the 20 year anniversary of the Cincinnati church, one thing that I, that I, that really stuck out to me, and I'd heard most of the stories before already, but the people were giving the stories of their conversions. And, and one thing that stuck out that several people mentioned is that they got to the point where they just begged God for understanding. They just wanted to know what the truth is. And that's the reason that the Columbus Church was started in 1999, because those people wanted to know what the truth was. And they begged God for understanding, and He gave it to them. Right? They are living examples, and and this is true of other lots of other churches. I mean, this is true of of lots of people. Right? That they got the understanding they asked for because they earnestly desired it. So I would ask you: Are you satisfied with your knowledge of God, of Jesus Christ, and of the Bible? Are you satisfied with it? And say, are you happy with it? Because you should be happy with it. But are you satisfied with it? Are you like, ah, I'm good. I mean, I think I know enough. Are you satisfied? Are you content? We should be content. Austin told us about being content. But you know what? One of the 11 things that he told us to be, that we should be content with, wasn't with our knowledge of the Scripture. You didn't tell us to be content with your knowledge of the Scripture. You should not be content with your knowledge of the Scripture. You should be lusting after the knowledge of the Scripture. That's right. You can't stay stationary in your knowledge of the scripture and your 
Christian values, you're either getting stronger or weaker. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. I don't want to be satisfied with my knowledge. I'm not satisfied with my knowledge. And, and the weird thing is, the more you learn, it seems like of anything, the more you realize how much there is out there to know. And I think when I was first converted, I it was probably just youthful pride or something, but you kind of, you've heard a bunch of sermons and, and you, you've seen Sovereign Grace finally and you've seen a lot of the objections answered. And then you just get this, this thing like, oh yeah, I got this. I understand this. You know, yeah, I'll take on that Harvard PhD or whatever, you know, anybody, I, you know, no problem. <clears throat> and then the more and more you study and then you realize, boy, there's a lot of hard stuff in this book. And the more I keep studying, the more I think a lot of passages, you just just glaze over. You know, you don't even pay attention to them hardly. And then when you actually start looking at them, you're like, oh, wow, how would I answer that? What does that mean? There is so much in this book to understand. And that's why I'm encouraging you to cry out to God, to want to learn more, to learn his truth, to learn his wisdom, to know him better. And I am exhorting myself to do the same thing. Can you explain your beliefs to somebody using Bible verses? So somebody went up and asked you, what do you believe about this? Could you tell them what you believe and say, and I believe that because this verse says it, and this verse says it, and this verse says it. You know, whether that's sovereign grace, or whether that's the King James Bible, or whether that's your view or our belief on the second coming of Christ, or whatever. Could you back it up with Bible verses? I've had, I've had people over the years that they'll ask me. It's nice that they ask, but they'll say, well, what do we believe about this? Well, the question really is, Pastor, what do you believe about this? Because if the person asking me is asking me, what do we believe about this? That tells me that actually you don't know what you believe about this, and you're asking me to tell you what you believe. And if I have to tell you what you believe, then you don't believe it, <laughs> right? So what does our church believe on this? Well, I mean, I get it. Now, if you say, well, can, what are some good verses to back up this or something? But like, what does our church believe about the second coming of Christ or whatever? Well, you should, if you're a member, <laughs> you probably should know that. Um, and if you don't, then start studying, right? Get those proof texts down pat. You don't have to know every verse in the Bible, but if you know one or two verses on every point, then at least you have enough to, to give an answer. My getting ready to come. I was just Oh, okay. So she should be here, so stop. Okay, yeah, yeah. I got another verse to do, so. <clears throat> Can you defend your beliefs to other people from the Bible, from memory, right? Now, maybe you can't quote the verse exactly, but could you, if somebody asked you to defend, you know, they, they started conde- contradicting some belief that we have, could you get out your Bible and pretty easily find it flipping a little bit here? You remember this verse, you remember this word, and I think it was in this book or something. Could you find it relatively easily and defend that belief? Right? We should all be able to do that. We should all be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. So, and that's going to require crying out to God for the knowledge. And if we do that, we are following in the footsteps of the godly psalmists who cried out to God for understanding of his word. Let's look at just a few verses here. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 34. See, this isn't something that is just reserved for the unconverted or the person that's just heard and he needs to learn so much that he needs to cry out to God. Here's the psalmist. He was an inspired writer of scripture, a prophet, right? And he's still asking God for knowledge and understanding. Psalm 119 and verse 34. It says, Give me understanding that I shall, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. So he's asking for the understanding so that he can keep the law. Because if you don't understand the law, it's pretty hard to keep the law, right? You've got to know it first. And it's pretty hard to serve God without keeping the law. So you've got to have the understanding first to keep the law, to serve God with your whole heart. Verse 73. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. You see, we have to ask for the understanding first in order to learn the commandments. 125. 125. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. Once again. Got to have the understanding first. And then Psalm 119, 169. 
Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. So we got to ask for the understanding, and we got to cry out for it like the psalmist did. And when we do so, it shall be given.